and the directionality. So basically, uh, there's something called the right-hand rule, which is useful for evaluating cross products. It tells you what direction force the resultant acts in. So take your right hand. Sweet. Yes, interaction. Take your right hand. Thumb is the direction of the velocity of the particle. So you have a particle moving like this. Let's say you have a magnetic field that's directed in the direction of the rest of your fingers. Then the force acts where your palm is, like that. So V cross B is the force. And then Q is just a scalar. So, um, so this applies to our cyclotron, because the cyclotron vacuum chamber, the sort of pie plate circle that I showed you before, has a powerful electromagnet that applies a fixed field in a direction across it. So you have your particle starting out with a small velocity in one direction, like that. Your magnetic field, the lines pointing down, for example, starts moving this way with a velocity. Force pushes it this way, so now your velocity vector goes like this. So you curves, keeps curving, force is pushing, and it starts moving in a circle. And there is a picture of that if you, if you enjoy pictures. So basically, yeah, so you have a plane that's demarked by V and B, and no matter what, the force is perpendicular to the plane that those two vectors make. Right-hand rule shows you the direction in which you're being perpendicular. Now, talking more about the spiral flight path. So, um, you have the force is QVB right there. And, well, just the scalar quantity of the force. And that's a centripetal acceleration. And just the formula for centripetal acceleration is mv squared over r. It's just a set thing for a thing that's being curved. So then you take the second two parts of that equation, rearrange them, you get the velocity is qbr over the mass. So now you have an equation for the velocity of the particle in terms of the charge, the magnetic field, whatever its given radius is, and the mass. And those are all known. Now, so there's that same velocity, which we derived in the last two slides. And this, uh, well, this shows how you go from the circular flight path into a spiral flight path. If you look at that first bulleted equation up there, you see that the velocity is in the numerator on the left side, radius is in the numerator on the right side, Q, B, and M are all fixed quantities. Those aren't changing at all. So you increase the velocity, the radius is going to increase. And you're increasing the velocity every time the particle goes across the gap between the two D-shaped pieces there. Because when it goes across that gap, it encounters the electric field. It's accelerated, velocity increases, radius increases. So it spirals out until it reaches the end of the cyclotron, where you have a target. Now, there's again the velocity equation on the top. And there's a thing called the cyclotron frequency, which is, um, well, how many times per second it goes around the circumference of the cyclotron. So that's the velocity divided by 2 pi r. 2 pi r is the circumference. So velocity divided by circumference gives you per second the units. And so you solve for that, subbing in the velocity equation up there. You get qb over 2 pi m. And the interesting thing about this, the most important part, is that it's independent of radius. And that's really, that's really why cyclotrons work. Because it means, well, going back to this slide. So it's not a constant electric field. The magnetic field is constant. The electric field oscillates. You can see the square waves oscillating coming up there. So you have to oscillate the electric field at a certain frequency to accelerate the particles at the right time. I wish I had a pointer. That would make that a bit more clear. I'm sorry. Um, so basically, you have to switch the electric field back and forth. Does anyone have a long stick by any chance? Um, or, well, no, I'll just gesture. So basically, when the particles are on, this isn't working, on the lower side of the cyclotron, you want Oh, thank goodness, whoever's shown a laser in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so you have 
You, did I break this? Excellent. OK, so you have your particles that are starting out here, cycling around because of the magnetic field. They end up at this point. So let's say these are electrons. So you want to apply a positive voltage here, a negative voltage here, to accelerate your electrons across that gap. Then they curve around like this. They end up here. So now you want a positive voltage on this one and a negative voltage on this one to accelerate it there. So you see how you have to switch the, um, the polarity of the two pieces at every revolution. And so because the frequency is independent of radius, like when they get out here, they're moving, the particles are moving a lot faster than they are in here. But it's timed correctly so that for all of the particles, you can switch it at that same frequency, given by that equation. So, and yes, as I said, the signal that you apply to the two electrodes, it has to oscillate at that frequency f. Now, okay, kinetic energy. So this is what I was talking about earlier with the 1 to 5 MeV. I'm not sure if this is review for everyone, anyone, but so kinetic energy of a particle is 1 half MV squared. You know what V is because that was what I put on the top of the last five slides or so. Substitute that in, you get Q squared, V squared, R squared over 2M. So just for example, for the cyclotron I built, um, these are not in the ideal units, Tesla, Coulombs, uh, you end up getting an energy result in joules, and then you can convert that to MeV. So 1.96 MeV, around 1, 2, 3 MeV is standard for this size type of cyclotrons, type of magnets you'd be able to build, etc. Now, in general, the things that affect, the most important factor that affects the kinetic energy that you'll be able to get out of the cyclotron is the strength of the magnetic field. So if you have a larger magnetic field, there's a greater centripetal force pulling the particles around. That means you have a tighter spiral, so each particle encounters the accelerating magnetic, sorry, the accelerating electric field more often. So you end up getting particles with a greater kinetic energy. Uh, just a brief review of, well, brief thing showing the different reactions you can drive at different energies. This would be applicable for, uh, well, never mind. So reactions you could drive at the energies you have. Um, oh, let me talk about this notation quickly. So this is uh, nuclear reaction notation. Um, so looking at the first one, you have lithium-7 that's going into beryllium-7. And the P comma N in the middle means you're slamming a proton into the lithium-7, and you get out a neutron and beryllium-7. And so for the next one, again, you have beryllium-9, put in a proton, you get out a deuteron and beryllium-8. And just showing that graphically, my nine boron is having some problems, but yeah, so that's the third reaction there. You have your nine beryllium with the five neutrons, the four protons. You put in an additional proton that knocks out. So you put in the additional proton. You see now that there are five protons there in the nine boron, and it ejects a neutron, only four neutrons there, five neutrons there, and now you have boron nine. So that's the type of reaction you'd be able to drive with these. Um, transmuting light elements 